library. Good afternoon, I'm Dean DeBolt, and I am, I'm here at the University Archivist here at the University of West Florida Library, John C. Pace Library. And this is another one of our library uh, stories from the archive series where we like to tell stories about something about the local history in Pensacola and thing. And today the title of our program is That Man May Reach the Moon, the Story of Pensacola's First Space Traveler. And to tell this story, I have to mentioned that back in 1952, the International Council of Scientific Unions established that 1957, 1958 year would be called the International Geophysical Year because they had estimated it would be a, a year with high level of solar activity. And they were thinking about the idea of encouraging countries and nations to develop artificial satellite to check on the atmosphere. An art story begins early on October 4th, 1957, when the Soviet Union shocked the world in the country by launching the first artificial Earth satellite, Sputnik 1. Uh, Sputnik 1 uh, broadcast, circled the Earth every 96 minutes, and it broadcast a radio pulse that, till the battery ran out after 21 days, and it burned up upon reentry on October 26, 1957. And it was really a shock because it was the first nation to do this. And secondly, while the U.S. Navy, U.S. government had also looked into launching a satellite, they were working one on one that they called the Vanguard Base Program. But this satellite only weighed three and a half pounds. Butnik, of course, weighed, see here in my note, 183 pounds and just the amount of effort it takes to take that kind of payload into space is absolutely incredible. Well, but it caught the nation off guard. And then one year later, um, one year later, I mean, one month later, uh, Russia launched a second one, but Nick two on November 3rd, 1957, carrying Laika, uh, a dog. And she became the first living passenger to survive being launched into orbit the earth. And of course, the big question of, of launching animals like Laika was the question of whether life could survive in outer space. And it's reported that she died when the oxygen supply ran out on day six. And it really wasn't until 50 years later that we got into the Soviet archive and learned that she really died died probably a couple hours after launch from overheating. And she was a stray mongrel from the streets of Moscow. And she was chosen because scientists believed that such animals had already learned to endure the condition of extreme cold and hunger. The American press called her Mutnik. And her launch, launch was the culmination of Soviet ballistic flights in 1951, where they had launched at least 12 do dogs in the suborbital flights. Following the Sputnik, fear and pressure on Congress and White House led to the increased funding of space explanation. The problem was, we didn't really know what would happen in outer space. And the Air Force had reported that they were working on the ability to monitor cockpit environment during a launch. They wanted to monitor the cockpit environment, temperature, pressure, altitude, cosmic radiation, acceleration profile, and they wanted to monitor uh, occupant of a cap of a of a launch, the blood pressure, pulse, expiratory rate, and so forth. And so, to achieve the goal, they began to try to begin to to send up animals just like the Russians had done. And the Army and Navy began experimenting with rhesus monkeys. And they went for the Navy. They had two of them. Uh, the Army had a candidate they called Alpha. And the Navy also had a program. And they went to Miami and bought 25 monkey, girl monkey from a pet shop and brought them to Pensacola to the United States School of Naval Aviation in Pensacola. And here they wanted to test them, especially for their uh, solitary confinement, and as well if they would uh, accept that having electrode put over their body so that during the flight uh, in the space, they could monitor blood pressure, heart rate, things like that. Out of all the monkeys, one of them stood out from the rest. 
She was stood out because she was very intelligent. She was one pound squirrel monkey. She was loving, had a loving and docile manner, and she loved to be handled by the staff. And she was a just extraordinary. And the staff were forbidden from giving their monkey pet name because they were they the army and navy both feared the protest from animal rights groups if, if word got out that they had the these monkeys and, and giving them name would actually even make them more human humanize them. Well, the army they named them after the phonetic alphabet. The army named their candidate Miss Abel, A for Abel, and the navy named theirs Miss Baker, B from Baker. The staff called her actually TLC, Tender Loving Care, because she was one of the sweetest little anim animals they'd ever had. And so they involved a number of creating a number of really high tech devices. And these are some of the pictures that they were using to try to test the monkey. And I, when I say high tech, you notice the, the, the 22 pound drum, which is kind of funny in retrospect. But these are the kinds of things that they are testing the monkeys on. In. And on May 28, 1959, a Jupiter rocket lifted Miss Baker and Miss Abel, the Army's monkey, to an altitude of 360 miles and 1,700 miles downrange from Cape Canaveral. The flight lasted 16 minutes, including nine minutes of weightlessness. Now, Miss Abel, the Army monkey, she had been trained to press a key like a telegraph key every time a red light flashed. But this apparatus broke down before the flight. They were unable to do that. And this is a picture of Miss Baker in her little capsule before takeoff. And then uh, this is a picture of her in the capsule, usually taken after, after she was, uh, came back. The flight lasted 16 minutes, nine minutes of weightlessness, and they also sent up samples of human blood, E. coli, onion, mustard, corn seed, yeast, sea urchin, eggs, and sperm. They wanted to test all these when they came back to see if there were any abnormalities, if maybe their DNA had been affected, uh, cosmic rays. They just really didn't know whether what human life would do in outer space. And 1,700 miles downrange, were just uh, east of Puerto Rico. And uh, they were recovered by the USS Kiowa off Antigua after they spotted the glowing nose cone fall into the sea at 3.45 a.m. in the morning. So pitch dark, but fortunately they could see the glowing nose cone and uh, about 250 miles southeast of San Juan, Puerto Rico. And they had a parachute which eased its fall. And the cone or capsule had floated on the water and was recovered by Navy frogmen after about 25 minutes after splashdown. The ship reported neither monkey showed any ill effects, and they were flown to Andrews Air Force Base from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Now, Miss Abel was taken to Walter Reed Army Hospital. And oh, by the way, this picture you can see uh, Miss Baker sitting on top of the uh, on top of the float, and uh, uh, Miss Abel, the Army monkey, at the bottom. Uh, Miss Abel was taken to Walter Reed Army Hospital. Miss Baker was taken to Bethesda, Maryland Naval Medical Center for their post-flight checkups. Dr. Donald Sulkin of the Navy Aviation Medicine Branch, based here in Pensacola, uh, called her the biggest damn ham in the world because she happily posed for dozens of pictures. And most both monkeys were described as uneasy during their plane flight, and Miss Baker wore a tiny jacket due to her sensitivity in temperature. These two monkeys became the first animal to survive a, a, a space flight. At the news conference the day after their arrival, after some jockeying among agencies as to whom could take the credit, it was agreed that the news conference would be held by NASA, who had furnished $151,000 to the Army to fly the monkey. At the new conference, the report uh, as reported the scientists were interested in the effect of launch, weightlessness, and splashdown on the physique of the monkey. Respiratory as well as heartbeat results were given for the monkey. For Miss Baker, her normal heartbeat is in the range of 290 to 400. At pre-flight, it was 326. Liftoff was 340, and up to 348 in re in reentry. They were all 
uh, middle middle range, and uh, and all. So they did very very well. Oh, and also at the new conference, NASA had to strongly make the point that the experiment was not related to their man in space program known as Project Mer Mercury. Now, following the press conference, the monkeys were returned to their testing lab, especially to have electrodes removed from their body. Ms. Abel was taken to the Army Medical Research Laboratory at Fort Knox, Kentucky. She was reported in good health, active, and happily eating. And uh, she had three electrodes, one in her right shoulder and the other located above her left and right groin area. The right one became infected, and the Army decided to operate to remove it. During the operation under light anesthetic, she developed cardiac fibrillation and died. She was autopsied to determine the cause of death, and especially if it was related to the space flight, and as well as being checked for radiation. The Army determined her death was not related to the space flight, but reaction to the anesthesia. After her death, she was stuffed and is on display today at the National Air Museum in Washington, D.C. Miss Baker, however, returned to her home in Pensacola, and had her electrodes removed with no trouble. Also traveling with the money were, monkey were the other things I mentioned. And on June 6th, the Army reported these samples continued their cell production with apparently no ill effects of space travel. On June 15th, Miss Abel and Miss Baker made the front cover of Life magazine in color, which brought more notoriety to Miss Baker because she's a cute little thing holding her, looking like she's shrugging her thumb. Uh, at Miss Baker is now America's first surviving animal from space travel. As a result, the staff of the Naval School of Aviation Medicine, Pensacola, Florida, was bombarded, began to be bombarded for information as well as people wanting to see her. They gave a presentation at the Lion Club, Pensacola Lion Club, at the San Carlos Hotel on June 26, 1959. And then they began talking preparation and showing off showing her off. She was actually in quarantine until all the tests were completed. In late June, the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals announced it would be awarding a medal to Miss Baker and posthumously to Miss Abel in recognition to her contribution by animal to humankind. William Rockefeller, ASP, ASPCA's national president flew to Pensacola, and on June 29, 1959, a small medal and certificate were presented to Miss Baker. It was reported she tried to scamper away when the flashbulb began popping at the press conference. Some news account noted that she was now the queen of the monkey colony at the Pensacola Naval Air Station. Rockefeller noted that this was the first time the society had gone out of its way to recognize the value of scientific America scientific experiment and not condemn them. He also acknowledged the tender and kind intention of the scientists involved. In follow-up remarks, her doctor, her doctor noted the next step for Ms. Baker would be determine how to survive. The next steps in the process would be to determine how to survive in the extreme conditions of outer space and whether other life exists in such condition. While Ms. Baker, and this is a picture of Ms. Baker with her tiny metal, and her her diploma uh, next to her next to her capsule space capsule, and so she became the queen of Pensacola. Naval everybody wanted to see this this little animal, and while she was proved to be in excellent condition, and happy, it revealed revealed in August by Pensacola scientists that in the days after her recovery and the new conference, she frequently chewed on her tail like a human baby sucking on their thumb, and it stopped once she got back to Pensacola and the other monkey. They also gave her a Navy rating, and now she was MS-1, meaning monkey, base, first class. That same August 1959, the Navy reported it was working to find a husband for Miss Baker as well as build her a new and larger home. Their goal was to find out whether there might be any abnormality in re reproduction due to possible radiation exposure. However, the press had a field day describing her new quarters as the honeymoon cottage. And especially after learning the new closure would be seven feet wide, five feet deep, seven and one half feet high, with formica walls and ceiling, a tile floor, special lighting and air conditioning. She moved into this facility September 22, 1959, 
However, she was kept in a three foot long, three foot high, two foot long stainless steel cage within the room, which had a large one way viewing window to allow the public and client to observe her. The other wall had a picture window, which let the Florida sun in. The idea was to, to isolate her from her from human germ. Despite the national announcement of intended matchmaking, little was publicized until Deputy Commander Colonel Thurston T. Paul of the Army's Missile Agency at Redstone, Alabama, announced on November 9th that Ms. Ms. Uh, Baker was pregnant. The following day in Washington, Navy Admiral H.E. Rickover was discussing nuclear submarine and stated, we can beat them, the Soviet Union, in two things. First, we have the only pregnant space monkey. Secondly, we have the only atomic submarine ever to run into a whale. And that's another story, but that's part of our history, too. But despite the announcement, Miss Baker's obstetrician in NAS Pensacola said she was not pregnant. There had been no attempts at pregnancy, and they planned to wait until March 1963 when they believed she would be about two years old. Meanwhile, she was happy. She continued to live a happy life at Pensacola NAS, were visited by staff and visitors. Um, in November 1959, at the Pensacola area, there was a two-day nurses institute, and the highlight was all bringing them all out to the NAS to visit Miss Baker, and uh, and other things. So she had a wonderful time here. The 1959 issue of Journal of Aviation Medicine was devoted entirely to her, and a children's book was issued in March 1960. The Pennsylvania New Journal noted she received about 100 visitors a month and that she had learned that grammar school kids up to about 11 years old are very interested in her and the whole subject of space travel. She discovered that high school students mostly don't have this interest and don't seem interested in much of anything when they're taken through on tour. But as for adult, Ms. Baker has observed they are crazy about being lectured to by anybody who has a white mock or a PhD degree. Pensacola NAS official stated she was retired from the space program because the public would be mad if she was sent up to space again. They would say that poor monkey had gone through so much already, she shouldn't be in jeopardy again. In November 1960, the Associated Press reported that Miss Baker had had a baby. This was a surprise because, again, the obstetrician noted that she had uh, she, she was not pregnant, and they surmised that because Miss Abel had gone on display at the Naval Aviation Museum, and they said it was not true. In 1961, in 1960, moving into 1960, Pensacola Naval Air Station also then began training the nation's first seven astronauts at the Naval Aviation Medical Center. On May 30th, 1962, tiny Miss Baker became the bride of Big John. She wore a wedding veil, beautiful tiny, tiny veil made by Miss Joseph Lynn, wife of Captain Joseph Lynn, commanding officer of Softly Field. Big John wore a tiny top hat and a bow tie, just as long as it took him to throw, hurl the hat across the stage. The press reported the happy cuppy would share Miss Baker quarter away from the other monkey and would not be pestered by neighbors bothering them for a cup of nuts. Sadly, on October 3rd, 1962, Miss Baker gave birth to a three ounce stillborn male at Pensacola NAS. Effort to resuscitate the baby failed, but it reported that the baby showed no, no ill effects of its mother's space flight, and Miss Baker was reported in good condition and resting comfortably. The birth happened 75 minutes after Commander Walter M. Shira, Jr., America's fifth astronaut to be orbited, was shot into space. Big John, who had been moved from Miss Baker's quarters a month before the baby was born, was reunited with Miss Baker on November 6, 1962, in an attempt to try again. In September 1963, Miss Baker and Big John were moved to Building 8, 1811, Apartment 1, which is a large brick building between the football field and the Naval Aviation Memorial Museum at the time, and her original quarters were torn down for a new low-pressure chamber. By 1966, the Naval Air Station of Aviation Medicine had had over 200 monkeys undergoing various aspects of space research, but its fam fam most famous occupant continued to Miss Baker. Miss Baker retired, lived a life of leisure, 
If they had a carefully maintained diet of jello, egg, monkey chow, fresh fruit, and water. And NAF Pensacola noted official noted no one knows what the lifespan of a squirrel monkey is. She spends her day playing on her trapeze, basking in the sun, and watching visitors. She continued to get letters from school children. And every so often, they, the Navy base would, would uh, make little footprints of her uh, on, on dictionary and things and mail them to people. If she got irritated, she chatters rapidly, and her keeper noted that monkeys were fairly good biters, too. In June 1968, the Naval, Air, Naval, Naval, sorry, the Naval Aerospace Medical Center celebrated the ninth anniversary of her space flight, and she received a morsel of cake. At the 10th anniversary in 1969, she threw the cake on the floor, demanding her special biscuit made of monkey chow and gelatin fortified with egg, vitamins, and mineral sub supplement. Vice Admiral uh, Bernard Dern, Chief of Naval Air Training, said she had set a precedent as the first woman on record to take a flight with less than 40 pounds of luggage and was one of the few women who never antagonized the driver or hollered about going too fast. Probably in conjunction with the America's achievements in space, Ms. Baker continued to receive hundreds of letters a month from children all over the world asking for pictures, autographs, and the like. Navy official noted she got more mail than the Blue Angel and suggested the sign over the gate be chained to Homer the Blue Angel and Miss Baker. 1971 marked big changes for Miss Baker. In May, she celebrated the 12th anniversary of her space flight with peanuts, animal crackers, and sliced bananas. With completion of the new Alabama Space and Rocket Museum at Huntville, Alabama, Dr. Werner von Braun pressured the Navy and other officials to have Miss Baker transferred to a new home there. After inspection of the proposed facility by Navy doctors and veterinarians, Miss Baker left Pensacola on June 30th, 1971, along with her second husband, Big George. By all reports, she continued to thrive there, see visitors, and live happily. On a side note, in 1973, Space Administrator Jane Fletcher fired the agency's top woman deputy assistant administrator, Ruth Bates Harris, who ran the agency's equal opportunity program. He became infuriated at her report, noting that the agency's affirmative action program was near total failure. In one part of her report, she wrote, there are no minority or female astronauts. There have been three females sent into space by NASA, two are two are Ella, Arabella and Anita, both spiders, and the other is Miss Baker, a monkey. Miss Baker's second husband, Big George, died in January 1979, and in March 1979, Miss Baker wedded for the third time to Norman Norman, age five, who had lived at the York Primate Center in Atlanta. Madison County District Judge Dan McCoy sealed the vow under the laws of monkey business. Since no one came forward to oppose the marriage, he declared the ceremony was completed. Although she never became pregnant again, she continued to live an active and happy life as an attraction in Huntsville. By 1981, she was getting a thousand letters a week from school children, and at 24 years old, was estimated to be 104 in monkey year, and at least double the average lifespan of squirrel monkey in captivity. In November 1984, at age 27, it was reported that she was very sick with kidney failure, an ailment of old age. She died on November 28, 1984 at the small animal clinic at Auburn University School of Veterinary Medicine of respiratory complication due to kidney failure. Pensacola NAS staff noted that she could charm anybody with her nice disposition and ex express regret over her move from Pensacola. She was interred at the Alabama Space and Rocket Center with a memorial service on December 4th, 1984. Center director read tri tribute from Alan Shepard, and John Glenn, and noted that she was the smallest historic artifact from America's space program, but unquestionably the warmest and most affectionate. Her grave marker at the entrance of the Huntsville Museum read Miss Baker, Girl Monkey, 
born 1957, died November 29, 1984, first U.S. animal to fly in space and return alive, May 28, 1959. The road to any great achievement always begin with small steps, and our race to the moon come from our legacy of those who have gone before, especially that of Miss Baker, Pensacola's first astronaut and America's first space traveler to return alive from outer space. And I hope you've enjoyed today's story from the archive and tell you a little bit about Pensacola and some of our past. And I hope you always remember the story of Miss Baker. Thank you. Does anyone have any question? Okay, well, thank all of you for coming today, and I hope you've enjoyed this, and we'll have another story from the archive uh, next month, and goodbye. Thanks, Steve. Sure.